this session, we are going to talk about inner child healing. What is it? How do you know if you need it? We're going to talk about the science behind it, the left brain, the right brain, and I'm going to share some of the things that have worked for me. So I hope you enjoyed the session and uh, yeah, let's just get to it already, shall we? Okay. Welcome to Advice and Stories. I'm your host, Donna Guerreros, and I thank you for coming back to another session of this podcast. And if you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much. If you could subscribe right now and um, follow this channel, I would really appreciate it. And if you can sound off in the comments and let me know if you've ever done some inner child healing, some of the ways that you've kind of approached it, uh, if you've gone to therapy, if you've done journaling, if you've done meditation, what types of therapy you've done, how did you know you needed it? And, um, you know, where are you in uh, this process? I definitely want to hear it. Okay, let's adjust the podcast a little bit. Perfect. I got the volume up. So before we start this, what is inner child healing? Basically, it's a way that you as an adult can take care of yourself and address the parts of you or the healing that needs to be done based on what happened to you when you were younger. And because of these wounds, these experiences, we kind of develop different attachment styles and ways that we have coped with this or moved through it and how we've integrated this in our adult lives. It leads to the ways that we communicate as adults, the way we show up in relationships, whether those are intimate relationships, friendships, the way we show up at work, the way we react to things, it, our defense mechanisms, all of the things. Um, and basically, it really impacts how we show up for ourselves in this kind of adult space. So um, I'm going to share some of the things that have worked for me on this session. I'm going to share some ways that you can start um, addressing this. And again, before we start, I am not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. I am not a therapist. I am a person just working through the dumpster fire. That is life. And as someone once eloquently put it in the reviews of my podcast, navigating earth school. And um, I'm just sharing my experiences. And listen, if you can sound off in the comments and you can tell us, uh, you know, what's worked for you. Again, this is community and this is people kind of helping each other and sharing along the way. So um, before we start this, this week, I went to Disney and I went to Universal Studios and I had I really had an amazing time and, you know, timing, synchronicities, all the things. It's so funny because uh, the last time I had been down at Disney, as I had mentioned on my um, Instagram stories, I had had, a, I was like 18 years old and it's when I had my first panic attack. So my therapist, when I was um, super psyched and, you know, wildly excited to go to Disney uh, was basically like, oh, I'm really happy that you're so, you know, you're so excited. And are you worried at all? And I'm like, worried about what? Like Mickey Mouse? Like, what am I worried about? roller coasters like what and she was like no she's like are you you know that you had your first panic attack there and I was just like why are you why are you ruining the vibes like why would you bring that up right now and why would you like ask me about this right now um and then I was like man like talk about sucking the energy out of the room lady um but yeah it was like a genuine thing and um this trip really meant a lot to me as far as like going back down there like seeing how much I've grown seeing how much I've worked on myself and, um, you know, just this whole process of, you know, working through these things and going back down and kind of, you know, writing a new chapter, I guess. And um, it was really cool. I accompanied my husband and um, his podcast partner because they were down there working. And because of it, um, NBC and Universal like extended um, such a, you know, welcome to us and really um, made it really nice for us and had a bunch of activities. We got like a, um, a tour of the park. Uh, which was super dope. And, and we had like a guide who explained everything to us. Um, that was really cool. And then friends of uh, my husband's who are now friends of mine, uh, got me access to uh, Disney and, and hooked us up with um, tickets for that. So that was super cool. And I think everybody, um, and yeah, it was, it was a really dope experience. And I have to be honest, in line with this episode and healing the inner child, I really went down there and I let go. Like, I was in, you know, it's like we, I said this to my friend, like we really tell kids that they, and children, they, we tell them that they have to act a certain way. They can't touch stuff. They have to be a certain way. They have to do a certain thing and they have to kind of show up a certain way in this like world and our, and this adult space, right? We're always telling them, don't touch this. Don't do that. Uh, watch out for this. Watch how you cross the street. Pay attention. Uh, don't eat that, but eat that. Like, you know, like it's a lot. And <laughs> I was in a kid's world. Like when I was at Disney and I was at Universal Studios, I was in that like formative year world. Like, you know, and I had to change because it's like, this is a world that's built for kids. This is a world that's built for teenagers. This is a world that's built where you can be your absolute, like a hundred percent in, in well, inhibition, like inhibited self and really 
experience the quote unquote magic, right? And so I had a shift because it's like, I'm in their world. I'm, I'm in like, I'm the adult here and I'm in the kid world. And it's like, I really consciously was like, I am going to show up here without like any judgment, not care if anybody judges me, not care if people are like she's 40 years old, why is she like buying a wand at the Harry Potter experience? Like I really was going to like give that inner child everything it wanted, just have fun, be whimsical. And let me tell you something. I had so much, like I had so much fun. I had so much joy. I, I was like, I felt like a kid. I felt great. And then going to like Disney, I went with Helene and, um, she's, a uh, she's one of my husband's podcast, podcast partner's wife. And, um, we went to Disney together and we went to like breakfast at the beast castle. And yeah, did we spend too much money? A hundred percent, but we had fun. And then, um, we went on, like, it's a small world. And it was so funny because she's pregnant. So like, we couldn't go on everything, you know, um, because obviously we didn't like want to cause harm to her or the baby or anything. And uh, we were going to go on this haunted mansion ride at Disney. And then we were kind of like, ah, maybe it's not a good idea if you get spooked. Maybe it's not a good idea if this happens. And then um, my, and then we ended up going on It's a Small World. Basically, we went on any ride that you w- could go on if you needed to be carried or you were like a little baby. And so we went on It's a Small World. And it was so funny because when we were in It's a Small World, she looked at me and she goes, is this the haunted house? <laughs> like, it's a small world wildly um overwhelming it's all it's very overstimulating and i know a lot of people like to um do substances when they go to disney um and you know go on like some of these rides and again i'm not uh, i'm not judging you but i'm also i can't be like co-signing this on a podcast um but you do you you know you're in charge you got the keys to your life if you are of adult age and can make decisions okay did we cover ourselves there i hope the lawyers are happy um but what um I would not recommend that uh, on It's a Small World because that thing is like every fever dream that I had during COVID, like boom, come to life. And it was a lot. It was, um, yeah, it was a lot, that small world. Uh, and then we did Ariel, which was super cute. We did like the tree house. We did a bunch of stuff. And then, um, you know, Harry Potter, Universal, shout out to Universal, shout out to NBC for like hooking it up. But um, wow, Harry Potter, Diagon Alley, man. I was lost. I was lost in the sauce. I took multiple videos of me with the dragon. Like, man, I had such a good, good time. And I really, I don't know, like the last year I decided to um, really kind of give myself the space of like not being so restrictive. Like, you know, I'm a nurse and I'm, I've always been into like health and obviously I have this freaking podcast, right? But And like this whole project, but I've always, I'm a nurse and I'm into health and I'm into like monitoring myself and like not overdoing it, you know, with like, you know, cause I've tried to watch my cholesterol and I was a cardiac nurse and I, you know, uh, try to, you know, prevent a open heart and bypass surgery if you can and those type of things. And, you know, just kind of like being conscious of all that and exercising and movement and osteoporosis and all the things. And last year I really gave myself the space to, um, not sort of monitor any of that. And I really like kind of let go with restrictions and, and gave myself a full reset. I like ate what I wanted to eat. Um, I didn't work out. I didn't like hit the numbers of like working out three times a week or walking my 10,000 steps a day. And I really like really detached from that. So I could like work on this, um, you know, this post pandemic, uh, fallout, um, you know, being, a, being a, a first responder and, all the things and, and kind of giving myself the space because doing both simultaneously of like, you know, having to like be responsible for like, you know, a hundred percent, I'm not saying I like, you know, didn't care and did things to harm my health, my physical health or, you know, but I just wasn't so conscious of it. And, um, I kind of let myself, uh, you know, not be, I I just gave myself space in that because I really needed to like dive into this. Um, I wanted to really kind of dive into this inner child healing and the emotional component of the mental And um, then I said in January for the new year, I was going to dive back into like the outer and the fun and hanging out with my, and I really did. I retreated last year. I pulled back a lot. And this year I said, I was going to hang out with my friends and go on more vacations and spend time with my friends again and go away with them and, and really kind of like go out and try to go out once a week and have new experiences and learn new things. And like, you know, touch upon that inner childness that isn't so much of like the emotion and mental health and kind of like, you know, why we are the way we are or the wounds or the triggers or where things like resentment comes from or things like jealousy or, 
you know, um, and learning how to hold space for myself. And like, I went through all that. And then um, this year I want it to be more about the physical, like, I want to be working out again, but I want it to be fun and I want it to be, lo- you know, looking forward to it. And maybe I'm going to take classes and, you know, get out of my house because I was like working out at home and that was cool and fun. But like, I want to go out and meet people and I want to try new workouts and experience the city again. And it's a way I can experience New York. And um, I want to go on vacation and I want to, um, you know, be with my friends more and, you know, try to find um activities that aren't so much about like necessarily going out to eat. Cause I was doing that a lot and, you know, just kind of be more healthier for, for what that means for me and my approach. And, um, so this episode really kind of coincided with like January and the beginning and the inner child stuff and, and doing the fun stuff again and finding the joy and like this like reset. So, um, yeah, all right. Enough about me talking about all of this, but I am going to talk to you about some of the things that have worked for me and this Disney thing, if you have the ability to do it, Um, And you want to go to a theme park or you want to go watch some childhood movies, like whatever you got to do, um, do to tap back into that inner child and don't judge yourself. And that was like the coolest thing about being at um, the Harry Potter experience and, uh, you know, Diagon Alley and Hogsmeade and all that. You're around a bunch of people who are super fans of Harry Potter and like they're not going to be like, oh, you're corny or oh, you you know, like I I was listening to this. Um thing with Emma Chamberlain and she um she said it so bad she's like sometimes you got to put on your headphones and sometimes you got to pretend you're in a movie and I even like made a a TikTok with this clip but it's like sometimes you got to pretend you're in a movie and you got to do like those silly things or you got to do those things that like you think people would judge you for or you know maybe that years ago you might have judged someone else for and like you got to go and do that and you got to you know go and do it it's so freeing it's so liberating like me being in in like Diagon Alley, like I was like, man, what are people gonna think? Like I'm 40. And then like I went in there and there were people who were like 50 and 60 running around, and then there were people who were like 10. And I'm like, this is great. This is so much fun. So, all right, let's get back to this inner child stuff um before I go off on a tangent. So basically, inner child is basically you at all different points. And if you're seeing me on YouTube, I am um I'm reading, I like I have notes and stuff. So like it, I kind of want you to like see how I do the podcast. So I'm not necessarily like always looking at the camera. So I do apologize for that. But um inner child is basically the inner you at different points in your life. And um let me just make sure this is all on. I think it's all on. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um it's the inner you at different points in your life and um especially through your formative years, which is like ages zero through nine. And the things and the events and the experiences and the traumas that have happened to you, how we've dealt with them, how we've handled these things and experiences, whether we knew how to handle them, whether we didn't know how to handle them, or like whether we didn't even realize they were happening to us. Um, And the wounds that we've created and that we've carried with us because of these things into our adult lives. And this isn't like a little person like living inside of you. This is like your subconscious. This is like integrated throughout your body, your emotions, your cells, how you feel, how you react. And, um, it's like, it's in you. It's just you. It's, it, it's part of you. It's like, if you got the chicken pox, you know, and you have immunity, it's like you carry the immunity. This is like, you're carrying that inner child. Um, and the science behind this, cause I know, um, you guys love science. The inner child is the right side of the brain. So it's right brain. It's emotional. It's creative. It's the subconscious mind. Um, it's also your gut instinct. So, um, right brain is responsible for emotions and it's formed in the first five years of life, which is like when um, the emotional components are, are formed in your psyche and um, uh, your brain. Now, I'm going to tell you a story really quick about a friend of mine, and this is, relates to like the gut instinct. I have a friend who, um, when she was younger, her mom used to drink and her mom had an alcohol problem. And she would always know that her mom was drinking and she would ask her, her mom to put like vodka or like champagne, and, like orange juice, have mimosas, vodka and orange juices and whatnot. And my friend basically would be like, are you drinking? Her mother would be like, no, I'm not drinking. And she, and then she would like taste her mom's drink or she would see her mom like pour it into the drink. And she'd be like, yeah, you are. You're definitely drinking. I can see it. I can taste it. And her mom would be like, no, that's not your, yeah, that's not what you're, that's not what's happening. You're not seeing, yeah, you didn't see me pour it in. You can't, that's not what alcohol tastes like. And she said like, she had this conditioning from when she was younger to constantly being told that she was wrong, that she didn't see that happen, that she wasn't tasting alcohol or she wasn't tasting the drink being different. And she's like, how am I supposed to, as an adult, trust my gut instincts? She's like, when I've constantly been told that what I'm seeing or what like my intuition was picking up on or what I knew like wasn't right, 
that I was wrong. And she's like, now you wonder like, why as an adult, I have so many issues with my gut instincts, with like sensing red flags or like my intuition or even like trusting myself. And that was something that she like really had to work on. So, you know, again, how those things that have happened when you were younger, how that's impacted her in her adult world. Um, And your left brain is the logic. It's the reasoning. It's the analytics. It's those red flags. It's the learned experiences. And basically we have to figure out how to get that like right brain and that adult, uh, which is that, um, you know, the right brain, which is the emotional and the left brain, which is the adult brain. We got to figure out how to get them to become friends. Cause a lot of times they kind of like question each other or, you know, it's that, that left brain is telling me at Disney, Oh, people are going to judge you or you're too old for this, or this is silly. And then that, you know, that right side of my brain, which is the emotion is like already feeling like defeated or embarrassed before, like I even, you know, scanned my, my past to the park. So it's like, that's kind of, we kind of got to get these two to be friends and we kind of got to, you know, get them to work with each other in tandem instead of um, being at odds. And um, one of, I guess, for trying to figure out how, you know, if you need inner childhood healing is um, let's see, basically you've heard of things like imposter syndrome You've heard of depression. You've heard of issues around intimacy. You've heard of uh, anxiety when it comes to social activities. You've heard about all of these, all of these things. And those are some of the indicators that may um, give you a little bit of like, um, I don't know, like a window or a spotlight into knowing if you need inner childhood healing. So um, if you like being with people all the time and you can't um, find yourself being alone, or if you only want to be alone and be isolated, or you have issues, um, you know, around anxiety or imposter syndrome or self-sabotage or feelings of uh, inauthenticity where you feel like you can't be yourself because you're going to be judged. If you have depression, um, if you have problems with intimacy and how you approach sex and how you approach your relationships, whether they're friendships or, um, you know, um, the romantic relationships, um, if you overreact, if you're defensive, if you have a lot of resentment, if you have a lot of jealousy, if you have unhealthy coping mechanisms, um, if you don't have any coping mechanisms, um, all of these things, trying to control other people's environments, trying to control other situations, um, these can be kind of indicators or, you know, a good place to start with kind of like diving in to see if you have um, any type of these uh, inner childhood wounds or, you know, issues that kind of stem from childhood in regards to the way that, you know, people showed up for you, how safety was um, maintained or created for you, how space was held for you, how um, you were shown compassion, how you were shown love, how you were nurtured. Um, and that's kind of a, a way to kind of figure that out. Now, um, one of the things is, why don't we want to address these uh, childhood things? And the reason is uh, because it sucks. And um it hurts and it's emotion. And like, who wants to suffer any more than they already have? Like we suffered then, like, why do you want to suffer again? And why do you want to suffer now? Um, but unfortunately you have to move through it and you have to work through it. And that's why one of the number one things, um, when working through this stuff is having a therapist or having, um, a a counselor or having, um, you know, a psychiatrist or someone in mental health who is really well versed in, um, in childhood trauma or childhood wounds or childhood healing. And there are so many people, just let me like preface and say this, like there are so many people on the internet who are doing such an amazing job at this, who have like dedicated their life's work to, um, to all of this, to childhood traumas, to inner childhood healing. And I am not trying to take anything away from those people. Again, I'm just sharing my own experience and what's kind of worked for me and maybe kind of like, you know, I don't know, giving you even, um, an intro into this. And there are so many accounts and there are so many therapists and there are so many um, mental health workers who really are so versed in this and do such a good job with this. And again, if this is something that you want to start working through, look for a therapist who specializes in this, specializes in this. And I have friends who have used, you know, therapists who work on childhood trauma and childhood wounds. And then after they've kind of like worked through this stuff, they've either stayed with that therapist or they've moved on to a different, you know, a different therapist after they kind of got through, um, some of that stuff that they needed to work through, but look for someone, um, and vet them and make sure, you know, that, um, they have your best interests and, uh, you know, that your safety and, um, confidentiality and everything can be maintained. And usually if you're going to a therapist, that's the case, but I know sometimes we go through like alternative therapies and stuff like that. So, um, again, just saying that same thing with if before you read like any books or, 
you, you know, dive into any programs, vet them and make sure, um, you know, it's all good. And it, it's, 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 yeah, it's something that's, uh, it's not like just a cash grab basically. All right. And that you'll be supported. Um, because if you're going to start opening up these things and you're going to start, you know, um, diving into some of these things, emotions can come up and things can come up and you have to make sure that, um, someone's there who can help you navigate through it and walk you through it. And they know how to do that. And they'll provide you with the tools and the safety. Okay. I think that's enough of the disclaimers. All right. Um, why else don't we want to do it? Um, because, uh, you know, maybe we don't know where to start and that's why this, I'm doing this. So to kind of give you like some insight onto it, or maybe we're embarrassed or, you know, you know, we kind of don't know how to handle what's going to come up. And again, this is why you have to find someone who can help you with this. Um, and how do you do it? Like a lot of us don't even know how to do this. So let's, let's, uh, let's get to it. Showing up for yourself in ways, um, that, you know, weren't provided for you when you were younger. That's kind of like the first way you can do it. Maybe that means tending to yourself. Maybe that means creating safety for yourself, whether that's financial security, whether that's self-love, whether that's giving yourself the experiences that you didn't have as a child. Um, maybe it's having, you know, your own space, your own apartment, your own place to live. Maybe it's going on vacation. Maybe it's doing things like going to Disney. Maybe it's having those, you know, free experiences. Maybe it's going to therapy. Maybe it's having a safe place to air it out or having someone who listens to you, who you know isn't going to make fun of you or who isn't going to break your confidentiality or kind of um, weaponize your words or your shares or your vulnerabilities against you. Um, feeling seen by someone, um, having a safe space to, you know, express your anxieties, your fear. Um, maybe again, maybe it's financial security, maybe it's uh, personal safety. Again, you kind of have to figure this out of what um, you need and how do you start doing these things for yourself. And um, the first step is like just accepting and acknowledging that you have an inner child and th that these things are um, actually there. And some of the ways that you can start kind of showing up for yourself and some of the ways you can kind of like reparent yourself and integrate some of these things and, and start doing this again, therapy, journaling, mindfulness, meditation, sitting with your emotions, tracking your emotions, um, listening to yourself, asking yourself questions. How do I feel today? How am I today? Why did I act that way today? Where is that coming from? Is there any experience I had when I was a kid that could have led to this? That could have, um, does this remind me of a time in my life? Did one of my parents react like this and it made me so mad? Or did one of my parents react like this? And that's why I react like that. Cause it's the only way that I've been taught, you know, how to, how to react in a situation like that. Um, you can invite it in and basically stop pushing it down or pushing it, um, into the attic, so to speak, and invite it in, invite it into the room and say, Hey, we're, we're going to do this. And again, get support, get someone who can walk you through this and invite it in and reparent that inner child and, and do the right, do the things for yourself right this time, whatever that means for you. Um, Think about and daydream about things that have happened that are good. Uh, moments that you've had in your life, experiences that you have had where you felt really, really good. Memories, um, places, people who've made you feel good. Picture yourself in your favorite outfit as a kid. Picture yourself with your favorite toy in your favorite place, the place you guys used to go in the summer or, you know, whatever classroom teacher that you love so much or whatever grade, like really like go back there and find the find yourself at that age and, and try to pinpoint that age where you felt the best and you were the most like authentic you and you felt great and you were just, I don't know, you were living your best life and you didn't care. Like you, you just were a hundred percent unapologetically and authentically yourself and like really make friends with that person and and tell them we're here. We're gonna, we got it this time, we're gonna get it right, and I'm here for you. And you know, you, whether it's having more fun, whether it's having more safety, whether it's, you know, having more love and compassion, whether it's, you know, I don't know, more security, whether it's just sitting and, and listening or providing good advice, you, you got to figure out um, what activities you need to partake in um, that lit you up as a kid or that made you feel good as a kid. And, you know, for me, it's like travel, it's taking care of myself. I love self-care. I mean, you've seen this whole project. It's getting dressed up. It's going out. It's going to nice restaurants. It's experiencing things. It's going to new places. Um, it's talking nice to myself. And when you start to talk mean to yourself and you start to kind of, you know, beat yourself up or you're, you're talking kind of shitty to yourself, name that inner critic so you can tell them, hey, 
stop. No, I can do this. I can talk in front of the room. How dare you say that I can't? And, and kind of like shut down that inner critic before they get louder than, um, you know, than that voice in you or that feeling in you that knows you can do it and, um, you know, kind of ruins it for you. So definitely um, name that inner critic so you can start shutting them down. And, um, you know, realizing that this wounded child has come from uh, uh, basically other wounded um, children in your ancestral line, whether it's your mom, your dad, your grandparents, like their wounded child and their wounded inner child has grown up to, you know, parent you or tend to you or take care of you. So it's like, when you see how deeply this stuff goes and how integrated it is and those patterns and those behaviors, you can see how working on this takes a lot more effort and it takes a lot more time. It's not just like flipping a switch, especially if it goes like three, four or five generations deep. And it's the only way that you know, and you have to like dig through this and find the root of it and why it's done that way or, or why it's been done that way all these years. It's so funny. I heard a story a few years ago where, um, a, uh, Basically, a, a woman was um, cooking this like roast in her house, like a, a roast, you know, like a Sunday roast. Um, and she was cooking this roast in her house and she cut the roast in half. And she always cut the roast in half when she made it. And her husband had said to her, why do you cut the roast in half? And she goes, I don't know. That's how my mom did it. And then one day, you know, she was like, I don't know. why." And he's like, well, why does your mom do it that way? And she, she's like, I don't know why my mom does it that way. She just does it that way. So then when she went to her mom's house, she was like, hey, mom why do you cut the roast in half when you cook it? Like, I know that's how you do it. I've watched you do it. That's how you taught me to make it. But like, does it cook faster? Does it, you know, like, what's the reason we do that? And she goes, that's how my mother did it. And that's how I watched her do it. So that's what I do. So her grandmother was still alive. So she called her grandmother up and she said, hey, grandma, why is it that you cut the roast in half when you cook, you know, when you make it? Like, does it make it taste better? Does it make it more tender? Like, what's the reasoning behind it? She's like, I'm just curious. And her grandmother said to her, it's because I didn't have a big enough pan. So the roast wouldn't fit in the pan. And so I would cut it in half and make two pieces. So there was no reasoning. It didn't make it taste better. It didn't make it cook faster. It didn't make, you know, it, it, it contributed. To, it was just the way she did it because the pan wasn't big enough. There was no real reasoning for it. And she had a bigger pan. She, you know, wouldn't have done it. And who knows why she didn't have a bigger pan. Maybe she was gifted that pan and she didn't want to throw it away or maybe she didn't have the money or whatever the reasoning for it was. That's how she did it because she didn't have a big enough pan. Her daughter saw her make it that way. So her daughter was just like, I guess this is how we do it without asking any questions. And then that passed down to the granddaughter and the granddaughter was still doing it like robotic and was like, this is just how we do it. This is how we make the roast in the house. And not until her husband, who was like this outside for, you know, source was like, why are you doing that? It doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't see any reasoning. And she said, well, this is how we do it. This is how it's done. Same thing with these like childhood wounds that like go back three, four five generations. Like your family doesn't know any better. The, your parents didn't know any better. Their parents didn't know any better. This is just how they did stuff. And so working through this and really dealing with it can be a lot and it can be super, super intense. So give, you know, give yourself time and give yourself space and maybe, you know, do what I did if you want and work on it for a little bit. Like I was going hard with Christina, my friend. And like, she jokes around and says like, um, you know, we're two children with credit cards. And like, even when we were throwing all these parties during the pandemic and the comedy shows on the street and stuff, our main theme was like, oh, we're going to have the parties we never had when we were kids. We're just like going to go crazy and like have these parties that like our adults in our lives would have never let us thrown and go weird with it and go magical and go big and go like super, you know, I don't know. It's like go weird or go home kind of vibes. And um, so we did that. And everyone was like, you're going to do a comedy show on the street. And we're like, yeah. And they're like, you're going to have David Tell play the recorder. It's like, yeah, we're going to do that. You're going to have a dance party on a pier. Yeah. Are people going to come? Yeah. Hundreds did. It was great. So, you know, again, we kind of were approaching it like that, like most of the pandemic. And that's how I was approaching it. And then I had to kind of like pause on the fun and the running and the like, oh, life's great. And how to be like, all right, now I got to handle some shit. And I got to like say the next year I'm going to handle some tough stuff. It's going to be hard. I told my friends, I was like, hey, I'm not going to be as active. I'm probably not going to be like, I may cancel plans. I'm working on some heavy shit. Post pandemic life's been rough for me. So yeah, I got to handle this stuff. And I did. And now I feel like, okay, let's go outside and have some fun again. So again, you got to figure out like working through these things, it's going to take some time. And then also you may need some breaks because the shit is, is, is a lot. 
It is a lot and it's a lot of work. And, you know, especially if you're the first person doing it in five generations, like Jesus, you know, it's a lot. So um, what else can we do? Talk nice to ourselves. I said, write yourself letters, um, send yourself flowers, send yourself cards, make cards for your birthday, you know, schedule stuff. I scheduled flower delivery for myself this year on a few occasions. I uh, scheduled flower delivery for myself on my birthday. I scheduled it for myself um, on an anniversary that was coming up that kind of I knew was going to have me in the feels. Um, I planned stuff out. I had things to look forward to um, because, again, that's like one of my like childhood things. Right. I love having something to look forward to. And a lot of times stuff that I was looking forward to and wanted and couldn't wait to do last minute was canceled or, you know, things would happen or people wouldn't show up. And that kind of was it was like a big letdown that I was anticipating and anticipating is like one of my things. And I kind of, um, you know, would make stuff really bigger already in my head and kind of have it all like figured out and go through how the day was going to be before I even got there. And I would set myself up for a lot of disappointment. Um, But again, I learned where that came from in childhood and I worked on it. And now I try to be present. I try to be intentional. I say, okay, we're going to dinner tonight. I can't control anybody's experience. Uh, I can try to have a good time myself. I'm going to go there positive. I'm not going to look at the menu and read it a hundred times. I'm not going to, you know, look up the place on Insta. Like, I'm not going to do all that because I'm not going to have an experience already in my head before I even get there. And then when I get there, it's a giant letdown. No, I'm going to get there and I'm going to experience it. Um, and again, this was me like working on my relationship with social media and social media is great, but it's like, you know, if I already feel like I've been to a restaurant and done it or been to a place or, a, you know, a site or, you know, a landmark before I even got there, because I looked through it so much on social media and TripAdvisor and Google reviews and other people's stories, like it, it kind of takes the gas out of it a little bit. So I, I want to have that feeling. And I think that, um, my trip to Paris was like that. And that was intentional. And so was this Disney and, um, you know, I looked up a little bit of stuff. I watched people's TikToks. And the moment I started like ODing with it and, and going too deep, I was like, that's it. We got enough. I know what I got to do. I kind of had to figure out the logistics of how you navigate the park and stuff. So I had to look up some stuff. But anyway, all right, let's keep it going. Um, get a photo of yourself. I don't know where mine is. It's usually here, but get a photo of yourself. Oh, I moved it when I was cleaning. Um, get a photo of yourself from the age. Again, that was your favorite age or the age you want to go back and heal or the age you want to go back and tend to and, um, put it on your desk, put it on your phone. Look at that. Tell that photo, tell that you I'm here for you. I got you. We're going to go crazy. We're going to do all the things you always wanted to do. I'm going to take care of you and, and go back to that favorite dress, go back to that favorite place. So you can feel that and you can remember that. And yeah, have that photo. When you wake up in the morning, look at that photo and be like, we're doing this for you, kid. I don't want to go to work today, but I'm doing this for you so I can take you on that vacation uh, that I promised and uh, follow through with it. You know, whatever, whatever your thing is. Um, you go to therapy. I love therapy. You know that. Figure out what triggers you um, emotionally uh, and work on those things and write down when you have a lot of emotion and keep track of it so you can talk about it in therapy or you can look for patterns um, and look up what might've brought that up again, or, you know, what's got you, what's got you feeling the way that it's feeling and, and journaling and keeping track of this stuff is great. Um, what else do we got? Inner infant meditation is a thing. There are books on it. There are people who specialize in again, vet those people, make sure you're going to the right person because of the stuff that could come up, what could be triggered. Um, I don't know a lot about it, but I know that's one of the things people do. Breath work, meditation, slowing down, listening to yourself feeling what you're feeling through your body, knowing what your gut instinct feels like, knowing what um, a hard yes or a hard no feels like in your body, ch- um, tapping into your intuition, doing exercises, trying to figure out back in the day, hold on, I got a hair or something. Um, sorry, going back and figuring out back in the day um, where you might've lost your intuition or where you second guessed yourself so much when you knew you were right, but you know you had adults or you had people in your life who quote unquote knew better uh, telling you you were wrong. Um, what else do we got? We talked about breath work, asking yourself how you feel doing self inventory mirror work is something that's worked for me. I love it. Mirror work is basically, um, where you give yourself positive affirmations, or if you're having like body image, um, stuff, you can look at yourself in a mirror and like really talk to yourself nicely and compliment yourself. And, uh, you can Google it and, uh, I'll probably do an episode on it one time, but anyway, mirror work is a thing. Um, go out and play. It can be as big as going to Disney and Universal like I did, or it can be going to play laser tag with your friends. It could be taking your niece or your nephew or your, you know, friend's kids 
we all got friends who got kids. And let me tell you something. They all would love to uh, have a break. So the next time your friends are going to the park with their kids, be like, hey, can I? I mean, again, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're not just going to take someone's kids. But next time your friends are going to the park, be like, yo, how about you sit on the bench and chill on your phone or read a book? And um, I will run around with your kids like a maniac and I'll take them on the slides and I'll do whatever. And you can be there. And uh, yeah, you can watch us because uh, I'll play tag with them. I'll play tennis with them. You can play tennis. You can play basketball. Go tell your friend. I'm going to teach your kid how to play basketball. Come on, let's go to the park on Saturday. I'll go with you guys. Tap into that feeling. Um, it can be going and watching your favorite childhood movie. It could be going swimming. It could be, t- I have a friend who just took swimming lessons because she never learned how to swim as a kid. And now she's learning. Um, and I will tell you from doing all of this myself that my mood has shifted. Um, I'm more aware of myself. I'm more aware of the things that set me off, especially when it comes to anger, especially when it comes to resentment, especially when it comes to jealousy. I can catch myself before I overreact now. Um, uh, instead of having to apologize to people for coming off like a total ass, um, I can work on my feelings of, you know, not being worthy or, um, feeling like, you know, when stuff comes in that I, you know, that I, I can, that I'm, I basically deserve it. You know, like how many of us, like a lot of times where stuff comes in and you're like, oh man, I I can't handle this. Or like we self-sabotage it because, you know, we don't think we do, we deserve that. I know so many people who get like a job and they finally get that promotion or they finally get that thing that they've been working towards their whole life. And then they screw it all up. Um, and you know, act so out of character, so not like themselves because they don't think they deserve it or they, they can't handle, you know, I don't know. They just can't handle it because they don't feel, I don't know. It's a lot of inauthenticity. It's a lot of self-sabotage and it's real. And it's something that a lot of us, uh, deal with. And so it happens. And I've seen it happen to a lot of my friends. I've seen it happen to a lot of my friends who, you know, finally get that TV show or finally get that writing job. And then, you know, six months later, you're like, yo, what happened? I thought you were writing for the show. And they're like, yeah, I fucked it all up. I just like, I don't know what happened. Like I couldn't handle it. I I just, I worked on, I tried to get this for the last 10 years of my life. And then I was in the moment and I was there and I'm like on set writing. And I was like, just screwing up and like showing up late. And, you know, again, these, these things of self-sabotage, so like, you got to figure out where this stuff comes from. Um, and yeah, I, uh, I have worked on this a lot and a lot of things I have done is, you know, is working and I feel better. And if you can work on this and you can identify what's going on for you, um, or you have, I would love to hear it and definitely sound off in the comments and let us know what's up. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a journey and this is only part of it and, um, you're doing great and don't let um, anyone tell you you're not. And yeah, I'm really proud of you. And I think that's it, but yeah. Sound up in the comments, hit up the YouTube if you can, and uh, tell us what's worked for you. Tell us what's, uh, you know, if you've even embarked on this yet, if you've kind of been through this already, and if you got some new ideas that I haven't talked about, please definitely, um, you know, sound up in the comments. And if you've listened to this or watched this video this far, thank you. I appreciate you and uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and most importantly, take care of yourselves. Bye guys.